Hello, everyone. Welcome to this free webinar presented by WePast. I'm your moderator, Christina Ruiz. During this webinar, feel free to use the chat and ask your questions to discuss the topic. We will take time after the presentation during the Q&A to answer these. Throughout the webinar, we will stop the presentation to review. Look for the multiple choice review questions, which you will be able to answer in the poll section. Please go ahead and respond to these questions as they come up. You will have less than a minute to answer each one. This and other recorded webinars are available to WePath subscribers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Be sure to register through WePath.com to become a subscriber. Today's topic is titled, Walk Through AAPM CT Protocol Management and Review Practice Guideline, presented by Dr. Diana Cody, Professor of the Imaging Physics Department at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Cody. I'm Diana Cody, and I was at MD Anderson. I just recently retired, and I'm doing this from my new house in Galveston. And I have an 11-week-old puppy with me, and so if you hear weird sounds, um, that could be what's going on. So we're here to talk about the medical physics practice guideline on CT protocol review. Um, it was actually the first one that APM managed to put out. Ooh, number 1A. So uh, that actually means that uh, we were the first ones then to be forced to have a review. And they, they must be reviewed every five years, and we're almost done with that process. And there are a few changes that I'll point out as we go along. So the goals of today's webinar is really to understand the purpose and importance of reviewing CT protocols and this particular practice guideline. Um, understanding the roles of the protocol review committee, who does what, and then I've got a few uh, real-life examples at the end to sort of illustrate how this process can work. Sorry, I hit the wrong thing. Oh, here we go. So this is where you can find it. It was um, initially published back in 2013. It's still on the APM website. This is actually an updated link. And we are in the process of going through the review for republishing it, the updated version, in JACMP right now. That's where we stand. I think it's the very last step in the process. Uh, I'm not completely confident about that. So who put this thing together? There were a small group of APM members that consisted of some on-site physicists and some consulting physicists and an APM staff member. So if you're thinking that you weren't represented when this thing was developed initially, um, you probably were. And the, uh, the updated version also had a small group of physicists that were about half the same. We replaced about half the members so that we could get some uh, fresh eyeballs and fresh opinions on it. Some pressure to get this really up and running quickly. You've probably seen it before. This is nothing new. So the it was organized in this way. Oops, I don't have in there. Um, Introduction, definitions, staffing qualifications, responsibilities, uh, the essential elements of the protocol review process, conclusion, and references. I think this is a pretty standard format now for these <clears throat> practice guidelines. So the introduction really talks about how important this process is and why we're doing it. It's intended to be an ongoing mechanism to ensure the exams are um, being performed and achieve the desired diagnostic image quality at the lowest possible radiation dose by exploiting the capabilities of the equipment. That's one of the main things we're trying to hit through this. It's really, really common to get a brand new scanner in, offload the protocols from the prior scanner, and say, we'll get to all the new bells and whistles later. And later never comes. And so this is, and I've been there, that's all about. So this is one of the processes that will hopefully help people stop and take advantage of some of those uh, new bells and whistles that they bought with their hot new scanner. 
the protocol uh, review and management system <laughs> is uh, considered an essential activity in ensuring patient safety. And so if you're getting some pushback on why are we bothering with this, um, very often waving the patient safety flag gets a lot of attention. APM considers these uh, review activities to be essential, an essential part of your whole QA program for CT. And so that's another um, justification for the time and effort involved in getting this done. So what we're trying to do here is set up a process to review, implement, and verify protocols within a practice. It's a very complex undertaking in the present environment. There's really a lack of great tools to help us do this. Um, I think they are being developed, they're in process, but boy, there aren't a whole lot of them just yet. And there's still a lot of challenges in optimizing dose and image quality. There seems to often be sort of an infinite loop sometimes that we can get into in terms of, uh, is it good enough? Is it good enough? Well, this is better, but that's worse. And, and it does uh, present a lot of challenges in the clinical environment to go through the optimization process. So what is this uh, practice guideline really intended for? It's really intended for CT scanners used in diagnostic imaging. It's not particularly applicable for CT scanners outside of the routine diagnostic environment, including CT SIMs, CTs that are used for treatment planning, radiation treatment planning. It's also really not in intended for use on hybrid systems that are only used for the attenuation coefficient part of the, the imaging chain. Um, if, if a hybrid system is not used for CT only some part of the day or um, the images aren't intended to have diagnostic quality, uh, then this uh, practice guideline really would not apply. And then image guidance for IR uh, procedures as well. That's, those are not considered applicable. The team has to work together, has to work together pretty effectively. And that's, that's one of the big uh, pieces to make this actually function well. Every team member brings a different level of expertise and each is really, really valuable to the process. Team members really should include a lead radiologist this is a radiologist who's willing to take responsibility for the decisions that are made. This is um, also we need a lead CT technologist and it really helps to have a technologist who really understands the ins and outs of the, uh, the CT scanner. We need a uh, and perhaps an administrator. Uh, this one sort of depends on your uh, facility. What else can this committee do? This, uh, this group may have several functions. Once you put it together and get things rolling, uh, you might find other things that this committee can actually really be effective at. And CT accreditation process is one of those things. Getting the planning squared away, submitting the images, uh, collecting the clinical images, all those things this group can really do a bang up job with. And then if you happen to be in a state where things like a radiation protocol committee are required, we are, I'm living in the state of Texas. Texas has um, particular regulations around this. And uh, so many of the regulatory bodies now are talking about CT protocol review. Most all of them talk about a committee and who should be on this committee the members of this committee can change a little bit depending on who's writing the rules. The Joint Commission, I think, followed the APR for the most part, um, but the Texas, state of Texas actually requires that a radiation safety officer be part of this committee. Um, I think the Joint Commission requires a lead technologist. And so um, that was one of the pieces that we added as uh, as those rules came on board, and it was hugely helpful to have a, a really good tech on board. Okay, question number one. 
This protocol review and management guideline applies to which CT scanners in a facility? A, all CT scanners. B, diagnostic CT scanners. C, CT SIMS. D, hybrid CT scanners used only for attenuation coefficients, no diagnostic CT only studies. Or E, scanners used only for interventional procedures. Okay, great. This poll is up and it looks like some folks have already started to weigh in. So for those of us um, who haven't had an opportunity to do a poll, I was just for you to go over to that poll section and go ahead and answer this question live. It'll only be up for about a minute. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask Diana for the Q&A section at the end of this webinar, you can go ahead and ask your questions in the chat window um, and we'll go ahead and go over those at the end. All right, I think folks are answering this question, Diana. So why don't we go ahead and go over the answer? Okay, so I should hit the end poll. Or did you do that? All okay. right, great. So, back to the slide thing. So, the right answer is B, diagnostic CT scanners. Now, this happens to be one of the areas that was changed in the um, update. And I didn't say anything about that because I didn't realize it until after I had turned the slides in, or <laughs> the question would have been framed a little differently. So in the, um, I'm going to back up a little bit here. In the new uh, updated Arf! version of this, trying to get back to where it's listed. Okay, I missed it. So in the updated version, the first two are still there. Um, we have actually taken this one out, which means that the protocol review should apply to image guidance for interventional radiologic procedures. I think that was our reasoning that there's no reason for that not to be included. Um, those exams should be reviewed as well. There's generally many fewer of them, uh, but it is important to make sure that we're getting reasonably good image quality for the task at hand in the IR suites. What has been added here um, as not applicable for this um, management uh, review is 3D angio flat panel. So specifically the piece of IR that is 3D angio and flat panel and also dental CT is not intended to be included or covered under this practice guideline. So um, the next time we do this seminar, we'll probably change that question up a little bit. So moving on, the responsibilities of the uh, QMP may vary, but they really should, someone really should be involved in a review of all the protocols. The level of involvement may depend on the status of the QMP um, in terms of in-house versus a consultant. The in-house QMPs are generally expected to be a lot more immersed or enveloped in this than a consultant and also wind up devoting a lot more time and effort to this. And it can actually drown you if you're not careful. Um, the lead radiologist often functions as, as a team leader. Uh, this is the best case to have the radiologist run the meetings and be in charge. I'll tell you that it doesn't always happen. The radiologists are busy with other things and they often um, don't really want to be the leader. If that happens, somebody else really needs to step up and do it. In our facility, this has been a medical physicist, but it doesn't have to be. It's really anybody uh, on the committee who's willing to take charge and um, help things get organized. The radiologists uh, are responsible for driving the image quality re requirements. They need to have a good feel for the image quality for the exams that they're reviewing in terms of their contrast. Is the thickness appropriate? Is the recon kernel giving them uh, the qualities that they need for these particular exams. Are they multi-phase? Do we have the timing down right? Do we need some adjustment there? Is the noise level acceptable? Is there some special post-processing that should be um, set up in an automated way for every case? So these are uh, the kinds of things that the radiologists tend to weigh in on. The lead technologist, oh, and actually, this is true for the radiologists as well. If you have enough um, protocols, 
Uh, at our facility, we, I counted 1,500 of these puppies. Trying to rely on any one person for that is really not, not we're in the process of sort of redesigning this and making each set of protocols um, the responsibility of a lead radiologist in each section or each group. And that, uh, that may work well for you as well. Um, in the same way, a lead tech might um, sort of share those duties amongst several, especially if you have a huge number of protocols to actually manage. The techs really are good at patient handling issues, things like oral contrast, um, IV contrast, patient positioning, injection parameters, breathing instructions, and how the post-processing really works as opposed to how the salespeople tell you it works. They're usually the best source of information about the scanner capabilities and limitations, and they're for sure the best source of information about the, the real operation of the process of getting the uh, exam actually accomplished. So what we're trying to do here with this review process is look at all the new and modified protocol settings for existing and new scanners to ensure that both the image quality and radiation dose are appropriate. This requires reviewing existing protocols and hopefully implementing new and innovative technologies that can improve image quality. So here we're trying to make use of all the fancy bells and whistles that are um, included in your scanner. So this uh, review committee is going to be hopefully quite um, agile with the capabilities on each scanner in terms of minimum rotation time, automatic exposure controls, on the two current modulation schemes, how KV selection technologies might work, the different recon algorithms and uh, iterative reconstruction, and even machine learning uh, reconstructions are now becoming available as well. And now the goal is to achieve the maximum performance of the system, um, but still keep the clinic moving uh, right along. You don't want to be, we've had some issues with some studies that uh, where the scanner gets a little bogged down making so many images and and it may not be ready for the next study when the patient's ready and the tech's ready. And so you kind of have to balance off those things a little bit. You also have to be sometimes a little careful about um, tube heat problems. Um, we've run into this before in order to get beautiful image quality on, on a particular exam uh, that might cause delays down the road. The scanner may need to sit and wait and cool off before we can do uh, the rest of the exams that are, have been scheduled. So we need to balance that up as well. And when we're doing um, anything really with this, we should uh, review the current literature and make sure that we're taking advantage of all of the, the cool things that everybody is talking about when writing papers. Okay, question number two. Who are the core members of the CT protocol review team? A, the radiation safety officer, QMP, lead tech. B, administrator, lead radiologist, QMP. C, lead radiologist, QMP, lead tech. Or D, radiation safety officer, administrator, lead radiologist. Okay, great. So this question is up and it looks like some folks are already answering it. So I just um, also want to remind folks to please ask your questions in the chat for the Q&A session at the end um, and go ahead and we'll give you a few more seconds to answer this question before Diana goes over the answer. Okay, it looks like there isn't very much action here. So we'll end the poll and keep moving. So the, the answer is C, the lead radiologist, qualified medical physicist and lead tech. And that is the one that most of the people got. So that is what we're um, recommending. There may be times when you add an administrator to this group. Okay, considerations. So you need to, somebody needs to be, and here it's usually the QMP, 
needs to be real familiar with any applicable federal law or specific requirements at the state or local level where your facility is located. And I had talked a little bit about the Texas rules and those are the kinds of things that are really important. For example, in the state of Texas, we must review each protocol every 14 months. So you'll see that the frequency of the uh, suggestions here in this practice guideline are different from that. So we have to go by Texas state law. So our interval for protocol review is quite a bit shorter than uh, what's recommended in this practice guideline. But that's what we're getting at here. Um, if there is a, a local, regional, state law regulation, even in, at the national level, that um, supersedes this, then that's the one you want to pay attention to. Okay, so these are the considerations important during protocol review. And number one is frequency. So again, this process must be consistent with federal, state, and local laws and regulations. And um, for example, the ACR accreditation program, uh, you want to make sure that you're uh, documenting your review process in accordance with those rules as well. If there is no specific regulatory requirement, uh, the APM practice guideline recommends that all the protocols be reviewed at no less frequent than 24 months. So every couple of years, all the protocols should get reviewed. And this should include any new protocols added since the last review. So that would probably be less than 24 months, but that's okay. And then best practice would be to review the most frequently used protocols at least annually. So the ones that are your bread and butter exams, you really, really want to keep a little bit closer eye on. Okay, so what would that be in terms of annual reviews? Well, the, here we're following the ACR accreditation program. Um, these six clinical protocols should be reviewed annually. And this is basically if you do all six at your facility. Uh, the pediatric head protocol, pediatric abdomen, the adult head, adult abdomen, high-res chest, and brain perfusion. And most of these uh, are familiar to a lot of physicists because of the ACR accreditation program for CT. And that was, that was the idea. So these would be the ones who should be reviewed on an annual basis. Now, if you don't do all of those, if you are in an adult only um, clinic, for example, or pediatric only, or you just don't do CT perfusion, um, then you pick something else to add to your list to get six. And we would recommend, again, your bread and butter exams, the ones that uh, get performed the most frequently, or perhaps the ones you recognize as being higher dose to get to this number of six to be looked at uh, on an annual basis. So what do you want to pay attention to when you're doing this review? Well, one of the things is how you name the protocol. We had initially uh, wanted to recommend to people and suggest that they use the uh, Radlux playbook style. Be and thinking really sort of long term and, and that this would be more of a standard exam name so that from a patient standpoint, they understand what they're getting no matter where they are, that they, everything kind of has the same standard name. It turned out at our facility not to be very successful. And that was really because of the way the, the Red Lux playbook was designed. Um, it kind of starts very basic and then they add descriptors that are more and more specific. And so the exam name can wind up being horrendously long. And on many scanners, the piece you want to see that tells you this is the exam I want is the very last one, the most specific one. Which means that if you're looking at a long list, you're looking at the last word in this long list of, of um, exam names. And it was just really not very effective on the, on the technologist side. And so we wound up kind of sweeping through and renaming everything to something that is more specific to us, but um, but is more consistent across all of the scanners, uh, even types. 
So if you can handle the Red Lux playbook, I think there are some real advantages to that. But I'll tell you that uh, we tried and failed <laughs> at my, my facility. Another thing to really pay attention to is who has permission to change the protocol parameters. Um, this is getting a lot more attention lately. Um, I think when these third-party protocol management systems are starting to, to be developed, Many of them are going to have a very regimented approach to this. Uh, there will be required checkoff, sign-off from several different people to implement any specific exam protocol. And that's really to force the issue, to make sure that people are aware that the protocol is changing and that we're good with it. Um, without that kind of a forced process, um, it can be a little difficult because you know, we go through the process, everybody says they're good with it, we implement it, and then somebody pops up and says, whoa, what is going on here? This isn't what I thought we were doing at all. So getting the, the process set for a, a sign-off or an approval process um, is going to be, I think, more and more important going forward. The other thing that can be really helpful is a change control log documenting the rationale for what's going on here. Um, this can really be helpful. Every now and then you wind up with a protocol with this very funky combination of parameters and you kind of scratch your head and say, how in the heck did we get to this place? But having this uh, documentation to follow can actually clue you in to what happened and what went wrong and sort of at what step did we take uh, the wrong direction here. And so that you can actually back up and um, go in a better direction. Question number three, how often should we be reviewing our CT protocols? Number A, at the joint commission recommended interval. B, at least annually. C, if no regulatory requirement in your area, at least every 24 months. D, there's no guidance on this aspect of review. All right, great. So this question is up in our poll section. So I encourage everyone to go ahead and weigh in now while you have a chance, since it'll just be up for a short amount of time. And um, we have at least one question in the chat for the Q&A. So we want to encourage some more folks to go ahead and ask their questions for Diana for the um, end of the webinar so that we can review those when she's finished up here. All right, so it looks like folks have weighed in. I think we can go ahead and go over the answer. Okay. So the correct answer is C. If there's no regulatory requirement in your area, at least every 24 months. Now this is meant to be all of the protocols. Now there were six that should be reviewed annually. That could be what happened with um, a lot of people saying an annual review was required. If you have 1,500 protocols, trying to review them annually is a huge challenge. And we have to do it every 14 months, which is almost annually, but it's a, it's a killer. Okay, moving on. So it would be, it is really useful to have some method for keeping track of the protocol review status. Having a, a clear understanding of the steps required and logging the process to date uh, is really, really helpful for when it stalls out. And this happens every day. Get, you know, going on it. Everybody's all you know, enthusiastic and eager and yeah, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And something gets stuck. Something happens somewhere. Sometimes it's we can't uh, get enough patients to scan on the new version um, or it can be the radiologist doesn't have time to look at the images and make a decision, or it could be something on the physics side that they haven't had a chance to actually look at the new set of parameters and bless them to move forward with some, um, some trial runs. And if it stalls, it's easy to forget where you were. It's easy to even forget on this thing. So having some way to keep track of it is really, really, really helpful. Um, we never really developed that and it just kills us. So this is one of the things that's sort of don't do as I do, but this is a good idea. <laughs> we just couldn't figure out a good tool to do this. 
perhaps just a shared spreadsheet would be enough. I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy. It has to be something that everybody can look at to see where we are with this protocol and who we're waiting on to, uh, to move forward. It's also useful to keep track of all the protocols that you are actively working on so that you don't take on too much stuff. If you're um, trying to make headway on too many protocols at one time, that can be a disaster. And it's also really a good idea to have a list, a waiting list, for what's coming next and to um, use the radiologist to help you prioritize these things. You have to be a little bit careful of that because radiologists all have their favorite exams. And um, so somehow you need to be fair about that, but it does help to have a list and uh, just kind of work down the list. So what are we looking at when we're doing this review? Well, for sure, acquisition parameters. That's kind of number one. So you want to be sure that the noise level, the spatial resolution, and the radiation dose are all really appropriate for this particular exam that you're looking at. For example, uh, slow rotation time or a low pitch would not be a great idea for a chest exam because of breath hold issues. That those are the kinds of things that we're talking about here in terms of acquisition parameters. These would include KB, MA, rotation time, collimation or detector configuration, pitch, on, on and on. So uh, here I'm kind of thinking about the machine parameters in terms of uh, output. Reconstruction parameters should also be reviewed to be sure that we're getting appropriate image quality for this particular exam. So things like image thickness, are we uh, getting the, the appropriate image thickness? Reconstruction interval, interval can be important. The algorithm kernel filter is a good thing to really take a close look at. And the use of additional post-processing like sagittal, coronal planes, uh, curved planes, whatever kind of makes sense for that particular exam. Attention to dose reduction techniques and making sure that you've uh, implemented them as much as you can as appropriate. Uh, we want to make sure we're using automatic exposure control, so two current, two current modulation or KV selection, iterative recon techniques, and now there are some machine learning recon options uh, to consider. And there's certain places where you want to use those now as well. So the adjustment of acquisition parameters for patient size. This is uh, this is really key, and. Once you've been through this a few times and, and you're good with it, typically we focus on the larger patients because that's the biggest challenge in terms of getting good image quality. Once we've done a pretty good job with that, I think we should be paying a little more attention to the smaller patients because they tend to be overlooked. We get great image quality, but I think there's often a lot of room to reduce radiation dose and um, live with a little bit more noise there. And this is something that usually gets swept under the rug. And it's something that I think we should all be paying more attention to. So here we're looking for either manual adjustments like a technique chart or automatic methods, uh, such as tube current modulation, KB selection, et cetera. And here we're just making sure we've got this set up correctly and consistently amongst our different exams. We take sort of a model approach, sort of have a routine test, admin, and pelvis. So here, radiation management tools um, include things like CT dose check. And so this is sort of at the front end. And the, this is one of the areas on the, the revised practice guideline that I think we did a little better job of. We kind of spelled this out a little bit more clearly. So on the front end, this is considered a dose uh, management tool. This is um, one way to ensure safety, patient safety, is to use these CT dose check kind of features and to set up some notification values so that the tech is notified when a uh, potentially high dose exam is going to be performed. Third party um, software tools, and here we're we're talking um, commercial products and or the ACR dose index registry. These are all really good ways to get a handle on what's going on in your facility to 
compared to others. Another thing to pay attention to during the review is how we're doing in terms of populating protocols across scanners. If you're lucky enough to have a whole bunch of the same scanner, this is um, becomes more of an, a logistic challenge than anything else. If you have lots of different scanners and you're trying to be consistent across all of them, that's a lot. Whatever we do, we need to process for updating our protocols. Um, we are probably probably do it monthly or even quarterly would make more sense. Documentation. So somebody needs to keep track of what we're doing and the fact that we actually have reviewed these protocols. Uh, that can be a challenge all by itself. And again, uh, including the rationale for changes as you go through an optimization program is uh, our process is also really helpful. The latest pro protocol you want to make uh, obvious and readily available during protocol selection and review. And then it needs to be real clear who's responsible for doing what in terms of maintaining the protocol description documentation. This is kind of be your portfolio book, if you will. And then um, everybody needs to understand where that reference lives, how often it gets updated, and how all the protocols are, are archived. You never know when you're going to have a horrible crash on a scanner and need to reload all those protocols. And so uh, the key people really need to know where that latest version was so that it's not a catastrophe um, the next Monday morning, which <laughs> tends to be our experience. So it's really helpful if we can get lots of refresher training, this, the group that's doing the reviews, to be able to recognize how to use our advanced bells and whistles the best. And one of the reasons we put this into the practice guideline was to help justify some of this refresher training uh, for this review committee. So hopefully, you know, we can get a lot of education at our annual conferences, but if that's difficult, um, hopefully there's means available to get that refresher training some other way. The verification, uh, this, is, this came up because you can do the most wonderful job of designing protocols and reviewing them, and everything can be hunky-dory, but if uh, at the, um, in the, Cynthia likes to call it, in the trenches, the folks who are actually doing the protocols and, and performing the exams, if they're making a lot of changes uh, sort of on the fly, then everything you've done is, is not necessarily thrown out the window, but it's not what you intended. And so this is verification step is really all about just checking that what's actually being done is what you think is being done. And so what we're recommending is uh, sort of a random survey on some specific exam types just to make sure that the protocols are being used the way that this review team um, expects. So you'd be looking at the same things, the acquisition reconstruction parameters, the image quality and the radiation dose. So question number four. What are we going to review during our CT protocol review? A, acquisition parameters, B, reconstruction parameters, C, dose reduction techniques, D, patient size parameters, or E, all of the above. All right, great. So this question is up. If you go ahead and go to our polls section, um, just below the chat option, you can go ahead and weigh in live. Uh, this question will only be up for about a minute, so I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to do that before we go over the answer. And also um, to be sure to ask your Q&A questions in the chat so that we can get to that at the end of the presentation. All right, it looks like most people are getting the correct answer on this one. Do you want to go ahead and go over the answer? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. This was uh, maybe an easy one <laughs> because they... For sure, um, you got to look at all this stuff. So 
the right answer is E, all of the above. So all of those things are something that you need to include in, uh, in the review process. So I've got a few examples of CT protocol reviews that were performed at MD Anderson. Um, two of them happen to be liver protocols because that I think is kind of the hardest thing we do. But we'll start with uh, the first one here, example one. This was a semen scanner liver exam. The radiologist is <laughs> complaining, not that they complain very much, but uh, they're concerned because the thin images that they're expecting to see are missing from the exams. The technologist responds with, well, they're not included in the protocol that's living on the scanners. Uh, the physicist is saying, gee, you know, I'm looking at this and the radiation dose seems pretty high for all of the multiple passes in this particular protocol. Somehow we wound up using the same quality MAS for all the passes, which is considered a big whoops at our place. And so corrections were made regarding the acquisition and the reconstruction parameters kind of all at once on this particular liver exam. So that's kind of trying to give you a feel for how this team can actually work together. Okay, question number five. Test another one in here. What is the verification process included in the protocol review practice guideline? What is it? A, confirm the CT protocols are reviewed on an annual basis. B, verify the, pro the protocols on the scanner are correct. C, perform a random audit of exams to confirm the protocols are being used as intended. Or D, certify the credentials of the protocol review team. All right, great. So this is our last poll question for this webinar. So go ahead and make sure to answer live while you still can. Um, and just a reminder, we still have the chat available for anyone who would like to ask a question for the Q&A. All right, it looks like most people have weighed in. I think we can go ahead and review the answer. Okay. So while B is definitely a good idea, it's just not what was meant by this verification step. The right answer was C, perform a random audit of exams to confirm CT protocols are being used as, attended, as intended. Okay, example number two. The physicist is doing ACR accreditation testing and the pediatric abdomen dose levels are really low and it's scaring us because it's not likely to pass the low contrast test in the ACR accreditation process. So physicist brings this up and says, yeah, I think we're going to have a problem here. We're not going to pass accreditation on this particular scanner. The radiologist says, gee, we've been complaining about that for a long time. Let's go ahead and fix this problem once and for all. And the technologist weighs in with, hey, if we do this, be careful about increasing the MA too much because uh, some of the pediatric scan fields of view impose MA. And so you can't just willy-nilly just increase the MA. Even though you're using a super fast scan and maybe a really high pitch, um, there are on some scanners some MA limits involved. So the solution here was to increase the dose on all the pediatric abdomen pelvis exam protocols, but being very watchful of the image quality reference parameter and KV. And the last example, Everybody was complaining at the same time that we have too many liver protocols. We had evolved to the state where we had a pre-surgical version, we had a routine version, we had a dual energy version. Uh, there were probably several other versions as well. And the radiologist was really asking for better and more consistent image quality. The technologists were asking for fewer protocols uh, to choose from so that they wouldn't make a mistake and pick the wrong one in any given exam. The QMP said, well, you know, we can probably design a single protocol for this exam that will meet all the needs for all these different particular scenarios. And as a result, we wound up with a protocol that was less confusing, had more consistent image quality, and fewer complaints all the way around. So those were just some examples of how this um, protocol review process can be very effective in a clinical setting. So in conclusion, CT protocol management and review is a critical part of a CT facilities operation. 
and it's getting a lot more uh, important by some of the state regulatory bodies crediting groups and professional organizations. And if we do this well, it should be able to help maintain the facility's image quality, which assures patient safety and also feeds into the continuous improvement practice, which is um, getting more and more traction, I think, in all of healthcare. Okay, that is the last slide. All right, great. So um, let's move on to the Q&A. And thank you, Diana, so much for presenting this webinar, by the way. Um, our first question, can you recommend specific papers, book chapters, or current descriptions of CT systems? Hmm. That's a really tough one. And it's tough because the field moves faster than the publishing. <laughs> as soon as you write something and publish it, it's out of date. And so um, I can't give you anything right off the, the cuff. Really, the best place to find out about all the new stuff are these big conferences like uh, the RSNA. All right, great. Thank you so much for answering that. Our next question is um, recommend recommendations for managing CBCT. OK, so CBCT stands for cone beam CT which is mostly on the front end of uh, radiation treatment machines, which I'm not very familiar with, I'm afraid. So I'm like betting O for two on these great questions. Um, I don't, I don't have really anything I can, I think a lot of the process of review would be very similar, uh, but certainly a lot of the acquisition parameters would be quite different. Okay, great. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, here we got one more. Can, could you recommend, could you comment on dual energy protocols? Okay, yes. We uh, have a bunch of standard dual energy protocols at MD Anderson. Um, they are, our pancreas cancer is dual energy. We've got some uh, gynecologic exams that are um, dual energy. Our chest group really loves the dual energy um, exams and images. We've had a problem on the GE side because they also love the super high lung algorithm, which GE does not actually give you an option to use with dual energy. So we're kind of stuck on that one. Um, dual energy is great for a lot of things, but it comes with a big learning curve. And that means that a lot of radiologists are very reluctant to take it on because it winds up kind of looking more like an MR exam with a whole bunch of different image sets. And a lot of CT radiologists really like CT and that they don't have to deal with that. There's like one or two that they need to look at and they're done. But with dual energy, you wind up um, sort of flipping back and forth in between these different sets of images to look for different things. And for some you know, really difficult exams like pancreatic cancer, it actually becomes more efficient because you know what you're looking for and you can see it much better um, in some series rather than in others. And so, but it still has this learning curve. So that's kind of where we are with dual energy. Um, it can be super helpful. Um, it also can come with a cost and the cost is sometimes processing time. That was the, uh, I had spoken earlier about the recons taking forever and maybe getting in the way of the next study. Well, that really is all about dual energy. Some of those um, processing times can be longer. I think a lot of the hardware has now been upgraded and it's not such a big problem, but. All right, thank you for answering that question. We have a few more that just came in. Um, um, I, this one you may have answered already. Where should I start looking for literature on good basic protocols? Uh, yeah, <laughs> all right, you're back. I'm back? Yes. Hmm. I don't know what happened. Okay, so where to look for good basic protocols um, and see what you can find that way. Is there a publicly available CT change control log template? Not that I'm aware of. Boy, Victoria, why don't you make one and make it um, available to everybody? doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to serve your own purpose. 
Let's see, the next one is dose modulation often requires patients of different size in a trial and error fashion. Is there at least one anthropomorphic phantom available for this purpose? And do you have any experience with such a phantom as part of the protocol review process? And that's another great question because you really wanna know that your protocol works on the small patients as well as the really, really large ones. And none of the phantoms are sufficiently human-like to really help with a lot of the you know, really important details, much less give you options on size. So the short answer is no, I have not come across a phantom that's useful enough uh, to actually use for protocol optimization. We pretty much are stuck with using uh, patients for that. Um, Judy, will dual energy be regulated by ACR anytime soon since it's so heavily used? And I, I know they are looking at it very, very hard. Um, there's a lot of sticky issues, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the different vendors handling things so differently. And so it's tough to really get an accreditation program that's um, going to fit everything uh, really going. But they, I know that they're looking at it pretty hard. All right. Thank you so much for answering all those questions and for presenting this webinar. Um, and thank you all for joining us for this free event hosted by We Past. So please be sure to join us for our next webinar, IPLAC LDR Brachytherapy and the Duke Experience, presented by Dr. Sheridan Meltzner on Thursday, March 19th at 6 p.m. And just keep in mind that this and other recorded webinars are always available to WePass subscribers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So register through WePass.com to become a subscriber. And for up-to-date information about upcoming webinars, be sure to follow WePass on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us.